Welcome back, one and all, to the Religious Studies Project. I'm David Robertson, one of your co-hosts. I'm here with my good friend and colleague... Christopher Carter, we are brought to you as ever by the British Association for the Study of Religions and as of 2016 by the North American Association for the Study of Religions. And this week we've got another interview from the stellar gent who is Thomas J. Coleman III. And this one is entitled Death, Religion and Terror Management and that's with Jonathan Jong. Ooh. Wrong time of the year but hey we're you know, we're, we're that far ahead of the game. So let's hand it over to Jonathan and Thomas. Welcome to the Religious Studies Project. My name is Thomas Coleman, and everyone listening right now is going to die at some point in their life. And we will have a special guest today, Dr. Jonathan Jong, who has some very interesting things to discuss with us about what happens uh, psychologically when we reflect on the topic of our own mortality and the role that uh, religious beliefs and many other kinds of beliefs may play in um, alleviating the fear of death. Dr. Uh, Jong is the Deputy Director of the Belief, Brain, and Behavior Research Group at Coventry University and the Research Coordinator of the Institute of Cognitive and Evolutionary Anthropology at Oxford University. Uh, Jonathan Jong, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Um, and, uh, well, we're very happy to have you on today and uh, to talk about death and religion and terror. Um, and uh, hopefully uh, you'll interweave some interesting tidbits from some of your own research and experiments on death and religion in the podcast. So uh, what is terror management theory? What, what do you do? What are your interests there? Uh, so terror management theory, uh, so I, I encountered terror management theory as an undergraduate um, in, in a social psychology lecture. And, and I thought this is the most interesting, if um, prima facie, implausible theory I've ever heard of. Um, I, I still don't think of myself, strictly speaking, as a terror management theorist, but I do think it is one, I do think that it's one of the most interesting ideas um, available for empirical testing in social psychology. So, okay, what is terror management theory? Um, terror management theory is a motivational theory, um, uh, which which is to say that it makes reference to to psychological needs that that are posited as as a function um, for for all kinds of psychological phenomena, right? Um, so, right. So, psychologists tend to distinguish between cognitive theories and motivational theories. Of course, there are no such things as purely cognitive or purely motivational mm -hmm. theories. Um, cognitive theories don't make references to uh, to to any given psychological need or function uh, or emotional need or function, and motivational theories do. So that's a very simple distinction to to make. And terror management theory falls squarely in the motivational camp. So, um, as the name suggests. Um, Terror management theory posits that the main psychological motivation uh, for all kinds of behavior um, is is the fear of death, is the the terror that that one day we will no longer exist. And this this realization, this this possibly um, human unique realization that we will one day inevitably die, um, is according to terror management theory the thing that drives uh, much of human behavior and and achievement. Um, it began. Um, more or less as a theory of, of self-esteem, of why we had, strive for self-esteem. Had roots in psychoanalytic theory? Is that that's, tr that's true. So it's true, it's true that, that um, terror management theorists tend to see their work as embedded in the work of uh, a, um, a psychoanalytically inclined um, anthropologist called Ernest Becker. Um, and, and, and so Becker's work still appears whenever people write about terror management theory. But there's a sense in which... Um, there's a sense in which it, 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 has seen, it has since fallen far from the tree. Um, so if you talk to Becker scholars, they will sort of frown and talk about how, you know, they're not sure that Ernest Becker would approve of the kind of reductionist, you know, empirical studies that we run, that, that sort of thing. And, you know, and that's fine. I mean, like, I, I, I don't think terror management theorists um, mind all that much whether or not, um, you know, people who think of themselves as Beckerians um, and other kind of psychoanalytically inclined existential psychologists, um, whether or not they think that terror management theory is a good thing. I, I'm not sure that that conversation um, matters that much to, to the, people, the experimental psychologists who, who work um, on the theory. So, so in any case, um, so the, the basic idea is that we, we realize that we're going to die uh, one day inevitably, and, and therefore that, that realization and the concomitant um, terror which it, it, it engenders 
um, needs to be dealt with. And the way we deal with this, according to time management theory, is to is to seek um, immortality, either literal or symbolic. Um, literal immortality is easy to understand. It is literally living forever, either you know medically, biologically, or or as it were spiritually. Um, and symbolic immortality. A little bit more difficult to get your grip on, but it's an idea that that is intuitive to most people, right? So most people think about how um, people may or may not want to live through their children, or live through their work, or live through their their achievements of other kinds, and that that is the basic idea: is that that we have many means uh, to to obtain symbolic immortality, um, um, and and so so in a sense, uh, time management theory uh, is. Um, uh, and you know, people feel differently about this. Uh, so it's a sense of which term measurement theory is, is a theory of the psychological everything, mm-hmm. right? It, it motivates literally um, all of human behavior um, and and achievement. Um, and and you know, it, it's it's and I, my first response to this was that this this is crazy, right? Like this is one of those mm-hmm. classic examples of like a stupidly monocausal theory. Um, and like no monocausal theories are true, therefore it must be the case that time management theory is false. Uh, except until you realize that there are literally hundreds of studies um, that that show some really interesting effects of, um, as as you as you said at the beginning of the podcast, um, very interesting effects of what happens when you make people confront their mortality, and then you go, well, maybe it's not so silly after all. I wonder what's going on. Um, I was wondering, could could you walk us through? How you would uh, well, you know, I, certainly, I suppose you could buy a gun and hold it to someone's head, um, you know, but that doesn't seem like it would pass the IRB boards if you're trying to inflict the fear of death and and someone. Uh, so, uh, pending that, how do researchers go about um, eliciting the fear of death? Right. I mean, were, were it only the case uh, that we could push people off buildings uh, in an extremely <laughs> safe and ethical manner, uh, and of course, we cannot do this. Um, so there, there is a technique called um, the mortality salience induction paradigm, um, which, which I will talk about in a second. But, but actually, uh, and that, that is the, the best known method of getting people to think about death. Um, but I think so. Right. So there's a difference. There's an important difference between um, generating the fear of death mm-hmm. and reminding people of their deaths. Right. Um, and and the, the latter doesn't necessarily come with fear, although you might expect that making people think about death, if people are afraid of it, they, they might that might generate fear in them. So it's um, not just a general death, you know. It's... Yeah, because you think about your own death. So so I'll, I'll, I'll say a bit more about that in a second. But but in, in in the research on on the role of death anxiety in explaining human behavior, um, people have done different kinds of things. So so in the 1970s, there was a, a classic study uh, by Osarchuk and Tats, um, and they they you know. They, it was very high production value. They got people in the room and played them videos, um, showing them you know images that would remind them of death. And they played dirge like music, and they were told, um, you know, they were, they were given facts about about mortality. So so you can do things like that, um, but but that's very rare now to do these high production things. I mean, as you say, nobody ever points guns to people's heads, uh, which might be very effective, but also impossible to do. Uh, these days, and, and rightly so. Uh, so, right, so, so you can either do a high production value thing like they did in the 1970s, or more commonly, um, the, the by far the most common paradigm is the mortality salience induction procedure. And what happens is uh, we assign people into different groups. Uh, in some in some conditions, in the relevant mortality salience condition, what we do is we get people to to think about and write about um, their own deaths. They, they're asked to imagine themselves. Um, dying, you know, what, is, what does that feel like? What happens to their bodies physically when they die? How it makes them feel? Um, and in the control conditions, they, they either think of something neutral, like watching television, uh, or, or something else that's anxiety-inducing, but, but not death-related, such as public speaking or uh, pain, going to I the guess. dentist. Yeah. Exactly, that's right. Um, so so I, I said earlier that there's an important distinction to be made between um, generating the fear of death and getting people to think about their own deaths. Mm-hmm. And that's important to note because um, one of the controversies in terror management theory is whether or not um, the effects that they see using this procedure are quote unquote affect free, uh, whether or not they involve felt emotion or, or emotion of any kind, felt or otherwise. Um, so, so there, for for most for most of the last sort of twenty years in which this research was conducted, it seemed like there was very very little evidence that that thinking about your death. 
um, increases your fear or anxiety um, in any measurable way. Mm-hmm. Uh, more recently, there's a little bit more evidence suggesting that um, that you know maybe if we measure things correctly, we can see movements on on fear or anxiety measures. Um, and and there's also some evidence that at least for some uh, some some part of the population, for some for some kinds of people. Um, they, they they do increase in in fear and anxiety uh, when when they think about death. So so that that's an ongoing debate of whether or not felt emotion is involved in the psychological processes that link um, death thoughts to whatever psychological phenomena you're interested in. Um, how does uh, how does religious belief or secular belief, you know, any belief perhaps, um, play into terror management theory? What, what kind of roles do uh, beliefs about culture and others and ourselves fit into this or play into this theory? So, um, as I said earlier, um, the, the, the fundamental motivation, um, according to terror management theory, is, uh, is toward um, obtaining immortality in some sense. Right? We are we're terrified of um, the cessation of our lives, and therefore we want to continue in some way. We want to achieve immortality. Um, and I said earlier that there, there are you know, two kinds of immortality, um, literal and symbolic. Um, and, and the role that religion plays um, is, is most, at, at, least, at least in the religions with which we're most familiar, which involve afterlives. Right, so so you know, like I, I'll, I'll grant the anthropological point that some religions don't involve afterlives, mm-hmm. but but many do, and certainly the as it were the most popular ones involve some kind of afterlife belief, whether it's uh, it's heaven or reincarnation. There's some sense in which um, you, whatever you are, uh, persists after after your death, um, and and that just falls right squarely into the category of literal immortality. So so religion fulfills that role very well now. Um, it gets a bit trickier uh, when it's when we're talking about symbolic immortality. Um, uh, so, in the cases of children and having children, um, your genes persist, I guess, or or your or you and you can teach your children um, your beliefs and, and that sort of thing. So, there's some sense in which you you continue. Uh, but but what about wider culture? Um, mm-hmm. The 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 idea is that um, we we live on in some way through our our cultural affiliations so we live on in some way through our ethnic category our ethnic categories we love we live on in some way through our nation states we love, people. We live on in some way. yeah exactly that's right so there's some sense in which uh, a, a part of us um, you know so we think at some level lives on um, as long as our cultures persist right as long as our our moral communities or our um, ethnic communities, or for that matter, our religious communities. So religion, interestingly, can play two roles, right? So religion can offer literal immortality, mm-hmm. you live forever in heaven, um, and it can also provide this sense that we are part of something bigger and more enduring than ourselves. And that's the sense in which religion provides, uh, insofar as there's a community and a tradition, that's the sense in which religion provides symbolic immortality as well. Um, so uh, you were talking about uh, some of the experimental paradigms that they use to kind of uh, get people thinking about thoughts of their own deaths, um, but how how do they know that you're thinking? You know, it's the the prime, the death prime, the mortality salience has worked. We have you know religious or other cultural beliefs on one hand, uh, and you know terror management theory prime on the other. How do how do the two mesh up? Right. So uh, so how the the experiments all work is they're all true experiments in the sense that people um, are randomized into groups. So hopefully, um, you know, if you're, if the thing that you want to look at is the effect of thinking of, of death thoughts on, on, uh, on religious belief, the, the idea is to match the experimental groups um, on, on, on that variable on religiosity. So that, so all the groups have more or less the same proportion of religious and non-religious people. So you're holding that as it were constant, uh, right? So it's a true experiment. So there's one condition in which you, you're thinking about death, and you're comparing that against other conditions uh, in which the participants uh, are not thinking about death, but thinking are, are are compelled are asked to think about something else. For example, you know, watching television or or mm-hmm. dental pain or uh, or public speaking. Um, uh, so 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 we can we. In, we can assume that um, that all else is is equal, right? Um, because we've randomized and maybe matched people into different conditions. So you can look, you can isolate the effect of thinking about death per se. Now, 
there, there is a further question of, for, for example, how do we know that, um, that when you make people think about death, they're in fact thinking about death. Now, I mean, that, that seems just trivially true, that when you get people to write down their thoughts about death, that they are in fact thinking about death. But there's actually <laughs> evidence, there's actually evidence uh, that's quantifiable for this, right? So we, we, we sometimes give people what's called a word stem completion task. So there are a bunch of words um, where we've removed some of the letters mm-hmm. um, and, and, and we, we tell participants to fill in, to complete the word. Um, and you can complete the word um, in a death-related manner or in a non-death-related manner. So the classic example is coffin, right? Mm-hmm. C-O-F-F-I-N. So say I show someone the word coffin, but with the, the letters um, O, I, and N missing. So it's C blank, F-F blank, blank. Now, you could fill that word with coffee. Yeah. And for those of us you know, who are students uh, or academics, it, it might seem mo- more salient to, to fill in the word uh, coffee rather than coffin. But, but of course, when you get people to do the mortality salience task, um, relative to when you get them to do other tasks, people are more likely to say to write coffin rather than coffee. So, so we, it is dem- demonstrable that the task makes people think about death. Um, as, as I implied earlier, however, it's, what's not obvious here is whether or not it makes them afraid. Absolutely. Right. Um, which is why uh, in most terror management um, experiments, it's important to have um, a condition uh, which, which, at least on the face of it, um, looks like it should generate similar levels of anxiety. So, so dental pain is, is a good example of this. So we know that it's not just anxiety that's doing the work, the generalized anxiety that's doing the work, gotcha. um, but that it's death-related anxiety that's doing the work. Um, what kind of experiments have you conducted, and do you know of uh, combining religion and terror management theory? Um, what uh, I, I understand you have a couple different studies and also probably some ongoing projects now combining uh, religion and terror management theory. Sure. Um, I, one of the questions I had when I first got into this literature was, um, was well, you know, so if, if the fear of death is, is meant to be related to death anxiety in some way, you know, like, are, like, are, are religious people more or less afraid of death? Right. Well, you know, A, what are the facts? And B, what should the theory predict? It, it turns out that what the theory predicts is a bit difficult to pin down, right? Because on one hand, uh, you might think that the theory would predict a positive correlation, uh, which is to say that the people who are more afraid of death should be more religious, um, right? Because yeah. because the fear of death motivates religious belief. You need, belief, to, right? you, you so, need so you to, might, to calm and quell that fear, so then... Right, so, you know, so you, yeah. if, you're, if you're high death anxiety, you might seek religion more. Okay. So you might think that the, the theory predicts uh, a, a positive correlation between these two variables. On the other hand, um, if, if you think that um, religious beliefs help to ameliorate death anxiety, uh, then you might predict that um, people who are more religious are also less afraid of death, which is a negative yeah. correlation, right? So you see, you see, you have this sort of interpretive problem. And it, it, it is a problem with correlations studies in general that we, you, can't, you can't really um, ascertain um, causal direction, right? So the, the thing I worked out was, okay, um, maybe terror management theory predicts a curvilinear relation, um, an inverted U-shape um, pattern, such that if you're non-religious, the more afraid of death you are, the more tempted you will be toward um, the faith. Uh, but when you are religious, the more religious you are, the less death anxious you become. So what, what happens is the, the inverted U-shaped function describes uh, two different causal relations uh, flipped at the midpoint, right? Mm-hmm. The, 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 causal, the causal hypothesis flips uh, from, from when you are from a religious person to a non-religious person. Um, so, and, and and, and so, so my early work was on uh, trying to map this relationship. Um, and what I found was that at least in, in Western countries where Christianity is, is, the dominant, uh, is the dominant religious assumption, even if not necessarily uh, the dominant religious belief. So there are some countries that are secular, which are more or less Christian, which have you know, Christian ideas just floating about. Uh, in, in the cases of, for example, New Zealand and in the United States, um, I, you do see this kind of inverted U pattern. Um, and and I have a paper coming out, uh, which is a meta analysis of of the of the relationship of this relationship. Um, uh, what 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 I see is that for among the papers among the studies that tried to test for this relationship, they indeed found such a relation uh, inverted U shape function. Wow. Uh, the 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 only qualification to this is that uh, it seems not to hold true um, in in other countries. 
Um, so I, I collected data from uh, the Philippines, from Brazil, uh, from Japan, from South Korea, a, a, a battery of other countries. Um, and the only other place I found this relation hold was South Korea. Um, uh, the only qualification to that is that um, we will only predict this relationship if you have sufficient proportions of religious and non-religious people, right? Because remember that the positive correlation side of the graph um, should be, only be among non-religious people. Um, and of course, in most countries in the world that are, that, that are not the Western liberal parts of the world, you need uh, most diversity. people are very, very religious. Exactly. We just don't have enough. Um, we just don't have enough um, to non-religious people. Uh, in South Korea, it's sort of 50 50, right? So about half the population of South Korea claims to be non religious. So we do have that diversity in South Korea, and the inverted U function holds there. Uh, but there is another country in which about half the people claim to be non religious, which is Japan, and, and, and then the, the, but the inverted U function doesn't hold there. So, so I don't think I can just blame the lack of finding this result outside of the West on, on sampling issues. I, I, th I do think that, that if there is this kind of relationship, it, it might well be. Be specific to to what the religious the dominant religious tradition is, but but you know more more work more cross cultural work needs to be done with really. it. So, so uh, certainly, kind of I guess we would say a, a cultural effect or a culturally mediated um, happening here. Um, in terms yeah, that's of, right. Yeah, r religious belief being a you know defense mechanism. Right. Right. Um, yes. So so I mean, uh, there's a lot of work on on you know. On religious coping, on uh, on what role religion plays in making you feel better when when bad things happen, and and there's a sense in which the death anxiety stuff is is a is a is a part of this body of work, and um and that and that body of work is extremely rich and complicated because you know sometimes religion is helpful and other times it's not all helpful, um and and one of the questions is you know what are the conditions, um and and so people tend to work on say personality traits or or something mm -hmm. like this. Um, in, individual differences, uh, but more and more work is being done on cultural, cross cultural differences, right? So, so what is what is the role of the the, the content of the of the religious teachings, for example, mm -hmm. um, and and that's something that we're we're really only beginning to look into now. So, so some of my my more recent work has been aggressively um, cross cultural, trying to get away just from studying um, basically studying. American Protestants mm -hmm. uh, for, for a very, very long time. Um, as you will know, the psychology of religion, the scientific study of religion has mostly been the study of American Protestants. Yeah. Um, and I think, fortunately, that is, that is changing now. Um, you, you asked also about some of the experimental work I do. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, so I, you know, I, I'm an experimental psychologist um, at, at heart. And so even though I now do a lot of correlational work across cultures, really I'm most comfortable um, in the lab. And so I, I've run... I've run studies in classic terror management style where I get people to think about death or something else. And, uh, and, I, and, I, and I usually measure uh, religiosity variables of various kinds. Um, more recently, we've tried to flip the causal direction around, which is to try to manipulate religious belief uh, temporarily in the lab. So say you bring agnostics in and you try to convince them that, that God exists or something like this, or you bring re religious people in and you try to convince them that their religions are bogus, uh, something like this. Um, and, and then again, and, and in those cases, what we want to measure is attitudes to a death, death anxiety, um, um, death thought accessibility, that, that kind of thing. Um, Building on that, uh, an earlier study uh, you had published, I believe, uh, love the title, of course, uh, it, uh, you know, much, much coverage there, No Atheists and Foxholes, or uh, Foxhole Atheism Revisited, correct? Yeah. Um, yeah, the, the No Atheist and Foxholes is a, is, is a great paper, but but not mine. So this is uh, Goldenberg and Heflick, um, or Heflick and Goldenberg, uh, gotcha. order. Uh, very good paper, too. People should read that. Let's. Uh, I'm, I'm interested to dig into the no atheists and foxholes. Um, what, what's going on here? What do you mean? There's no atheists and foxholes. Okay. Uh, so <laughs> big uh, so, qualifications, perhaps here. Yeah, th that's right. So, well, I mean, you will note that the title doesn't claim that there are no atheists and foxholes. Yeah. It it claims to revisit the question of whether there are atheists and foxholes. Um, so, one of the interesting things about terror management theory um, is that um, there are cases in which there is a tension. Um, between, for example, ritual immortality and symbolic immortality. Right? So, for example, if you're an atheist, um, if you're an atheist, the the quest for literal immortality um, is is still the same pool of things as if you're a theist, right? So, so you you might okay, so you might seek to extend your life indefinitely through science, uh, but 
uh, but but you know, but it's also possible that you'll be tempted to believe um, in, in in an afterlife, mm. right? The problem with believing in an afterlife uh, for an atheist is that it goes against their cultural worldviews or their personal worldviews, and therefore um, it violates their their desire for for symbolic immortality. So one of the interesting questions to ask is, okay, so if you get people to, if you get atheists, um, if you get non-religious people more generally to think about death, um, uh, what, what will happen, right? Will they, will, they, will they give up their symbolic immortality desires and cave and seek literal immortality instead? Or, uh, or will they you know, disregard their concern for literal immortality and run uh, for symbolic immortality? I'm assuming you, could, you, you don't ask these people, right? It's not like you know, you're talking to an, an atheist and you know, there's a mortality salience prime and then you, you know, do you believe in God a little bit more now? Well, so okay, so but you could do that, right? You could do that and see what happens. So, so we, so so we did in fact do that in one of the studies in this paper where we got people to think about that. Some of them were religious, some of them were non-religious, and we we looked at them separately, we compared them, um, and but but the interesting the interesting population, the interesting part of the sample is um, are, are the non-religious people, of course, uh, and, and and when you ask them directly, do you believe in God? Do you believe in angels and demons and heaven and hell, etc.? Um, they they run to their non-religious. Pieties, right? Say no, right? Right? Strongly disagree. Absolutely not. There's no God, etc. Uh, so, so you see a, a nice strong effect um, of of what Terry Magic theory is called the the worldview defense effect. So when people think about death, we want to defend our worldviews. And in this case, for non-religious people, their worldview is secular. Mm-hmm. Um, it it entails a kind of um, a, a rejection of of the supernatural. And that's exactly what you find. Non-religious people, when they think about death, they become, as it were, they become less religious. Mm-hmm. They become more anti-religious. Right, depending on your perspective. Um, so we thought, okay, so that's very interesting. But what if we measure um, religious belief uh, implicitly? Right? What if we don't ask people directly, but we try and ascertain what their their beliefs are um, in a kind of sneakier fashion? Um, uh, and and one of the common ways this is done in in social cognitive psychology um, is through various um, procedures that rely on response times. Mm-hmm. Um, a silly example of this is if you ask somebody to tell you um, what their attitude is as quickly as possible. So if I ask you, for example, do you think that like you know tables exist? You then say, oh yes, you know very quickly because you're quite confident that tables exist. Uh, if I ask you whether or not say quarks exist, you might be less certain, and you might still say yes, but you might take a longer time to say so. So that's a very kind of crude way of using reaction time uh, to to assess. The strength of people's attitudes or beliefs, and and we so we did that. Mm-hmm. Um, but but the, the more common way of doing it is something called the implicit association test. I don't want to to, to say too much about the, the ins and outs of how to run an implicit association test. But but the basic idea is we, we give you a categorization task, and um, and we we want to know uh, whether or not um, you you find it harder, which is to say you take longer to associate um, uh, religious concepts like gods, angels, demons, heaven and hell, mm-hmm. uh, with the category real um, versus the category imaginary. Right? So we present you stimuli that you have to categorize as quickly as possible as real or imaginary, and we also present you with stimuli um, that, that show you religious concepts that you have to categorize with the same keys, with either the real key um, or the imaginary key, and what we do is we work out which one you find harder. Do you find it harder to respond to religious concepts when they're paired with, relig- with, with real things or when they're paired with imaginary things? Right? And that allows us to work out um, what, your, what your, your, your attitudes are toward, uh, toward religious, uh, religious uh, concepts. Of course, um, implicit that, subconscious, you know, at, at this level, we're not talking about a belief necessarily in the same sense like, uh, you know, I would tell you what my belief is on something. You know, we right. kind of discussed this, but just wanted to clarify that when we're kind of talking about an implicit belief, so to speak, it doesn't line up as clean as we might like a- always with an explicit belief. Right, okay, so, so I guess it is important to say that there, I mean, there is controversy over what these tasks do. Right, so um, the most minimal interpretation of what these tasks, these these reaction time tasks, are doing, um, is that they're getting at um, attitudes that you're not um, willing or able to report. Right. Um, so, 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 at, at, if if that's how you think about it, then what you what you do is you refer to these things as implicit measures of attitudes. 
Um, there is there is a, a more there's a kind of you know more controversial way of interpreting um, what these implicit measures are doing, uh, uh, um, which is which is that they're measuring different kinds of beliefs and attitudes than the ones that you can and are willing to report um, in say a questionnaire. Um, uh, and, and so if you, if you, if you think of that, then what you might want to say is that these are measures of implicit beliefs. Um, I, I think people reasonably disagree about whether or not there are such things as implicit beliefs that are, you know, in some way different from explicit beliefs. Another topic um, for another podcast in full, but <laughs> I, that's probably true. Um, yeah, I mean, this might be something that you want to cover at some point. I mean, my, my own view tends to be that, that these two, these two things, explicit and implicit beliefs are not totally different things. Right. Um, I, uh, like a lot of social psychologists, I think that um, a lot of our beliefs and attitudes begin um, as inchoate, kind of very difficult to express um, associations in our minds. Um, and through some reflective or metacognitive process, they become propositional, explicit attitudes and beliefs. Uh, so, so there is a causal relationship between the, the intuitive, if you like, the unconscious, if you like, you know, the associative, if you like. Um, there's a causal connection between between that inchoate level um, and and the more expressible propositional level. So these are not totally separate things, but but they but they but they do come apart under some conditions. And um, and in the study that that we were talking about, they do come apart. So sure. so in in the case of the implicit measures, uh, non-religious people uh, become more religious when they think about death, mm. as do as do religious people. Yeah. So so for non-religious people, there seems to be this this divergence uh, between their, their explicit beliefs and their implicit beliefs, if you like, when you think about that. Well, uh, Dr. Jonathan John, thank you very much for joining us on the Religious Studies Project today. Um, is, there a, is there a website where listeners can go to find out more about your work? And I was also uh, give you a few seconds uh, to plug the book. You have a new book coming out. Right. Yes, that's right. So, uh, so, so I was talking earlier about about the, the work, the, the cross cultural work that I've done, and the experimental work that, that I've done, and and um, and I'm still doing uh, on 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 death anxiety and religious belief. And my co-author Jamin Halberstadt, who's a professor of psychology at the University of Otago in New Zealand, and I have written a book to be published by Bloomsbury. It's called, uh, conveniently enough, uh, death anxiety and religious belief, and that should be out um, sometime um, this year. Uh, we're, we're hoping it'll be out before the beginning. Before, before mid-year. Uh, so do, do check that out. Uh, my website is jonathanjong.net um, and you can find most of my work there as well. Great. Thank you very much, John. Thank you for having me again. Thanks very much for that, Tommy. Fantastic to get another cognitive psychological perspective and listeners might be interested to check out a post that Robert Arrowwood wrote for us um, as a Halloween special back um, I think it was coming on two years ago, sort of a year and a half ago, um, as a sort of Halloween special, Terror Management Theory. Um, also, he should be writing the response to this interview, so you'll get to hear more of his work as well, which is fantastic. Um, next week, uh, we're going from sort of RSP stalwart interviewer to new interviewer. We've got Adam Miller. Um, he's speaking with John Modern and Catherine Lofton. And the interview is entitled Descriptions of Religion as Explanations of Religion. So we're really looking forward to hearing from Adam. And that should be a really exciting interview. That was recorded, I believe, at the um, Florida State University uh, Graduate um, Religious Studies Symposium. It was indeed. Um, Talking of interviews recorded, I was recently interviewed. Um, You were. You've been... uh, flouncing about going on other programs it was on us radio actually wasn't it It was it was on um a show called to the best of our knowledge um which goes out across um i think about 200 stations in the us which is terrifying terror i need some terror management is what i need but yeah you can if you if you want to catch that interview with me uh, talking about my work on um, UFOs and conspiracy theories and the New Age movement. Um, you can find that at www.ttbook.com. That's to the best of our knowledge or TT Book. Wonderful. And uh, it'll be a useful appetizer because in a few weeks, um, David Robertson and we'll be speaking to the Religious Studies Project about um, UFOs, conspiracy theories, and religion. 
Um, so come back in a few weeks to hear that. Exciting. What other interviews do we have coming up, Chris? We were just running through a few. Yeah, we've got a few. Um, so we've got um, Dusty Hosley has been speaking with Lynn Davidman on conversion and deconversion as concepts, um, largely in the sociology of religion. But that's that's a topic I'm quite interested in. You know, why do we talk about you know, people converting and deconverting from religions, but that, that that presumes a sort of neutral territory that... Indeed, a sort of no man's land between the two, right? Yeah, you don't talk about converting to secularism, do you? So um, that'll be a really fascinating interview. Indeed. And um, we're just putting the finishing touches to a few, to the the rest of our lineup going up to our summer break. We haven't quite set the date yet there, but it'll be... What, some point in June? Yes, yeah, usually, we usually keep going till the end of June. Okay, so so at some point around there we'll be taking our usual uh, summer break to give you all a chance to catch up. And for us, um, to go out and go to lots of conferences and record the interviews for the, uh, for the autumn um, yeah. series. And um, we're just uh, settling on uh, me going to the Soccerel conference at the start of July at Lancaster University, where I've got at least two interviews lined up um, so far with uh, Don Llewellyn and Naomi Stanton, who were uh, good friends of the RSP. And I'll be going to the EASR conference in Helsinki, um, which is, I think, fairly soon, actually. I think it's... Mm, it's also in July. I think. Is it July? Yeah. Oh, I thought it was <laughs> Okay. <laughs> we're so organised here. It's but I'll, I'll, I've got one set up already, and I'll be doing a number there. And that's not to mention, of course, the BASRs conference, which um, we already have a few things um, in the pipeline there. Right. So, so more Wolverhampton ab- at the start of September. Indeed. Um, and more about that, I'm sure, later. Uh, we've been wittering on, so as ever, we should quickly wrap up by f- doing a rapid fire Facebook, iTunes, Google, Twitter, YouTube, Amazon.com, .co.uk, .ca, and basically saying that wonderful admonition at the end of every podcast. Thanks for listening. Ah!